Welcome to the Scottish Watches podcast. It's time to check in with our child. He flew the coop, he left for university a number of months ago. Me and Dave have been worried sick, but it's time to check if the stabilizer have been taken off the bike that is Andrew Morgan Watches. How are you doing, Andrew? How are things? Very well, thank you. I've fallen immediately in with the wrong crowd, and now I'm very badly hooked on uh, watches, even more so than I already was. So, yeah, I've not been attending any lessons. I've been throwing stones at the teachers. It's it's all gone it's all gone awry. You've been hooked on a very addictive substance that is going to lead you <laughs> down many dark paths and alleyways, hopefully not be jumped or worse, and you've got no money left and you actually owe people a fortune, is that what you're telling me? I think this is less uh, a, a situation where I've been sent to university, I've more been sent to a rehabilitation clinic, but unfortunately that rehabilitation clinic is also a dealer. Uh, so there's a lot of conflict of interest here, uh, so it's massively spiralled out of control. Fair enough, and that is something that I've always thought about. When I'm talking to normies, friends and colleagues in different industries, and I say, I was on the phone with my dealer earlier on, I just wonder what they actually think of me. <laughs> I think, let's say, let's see, given the, the accent, given you know the shave-headed demeanour, I think they're completely fine with that. I'm like, yeah, I anticipate they would be surprised you meant watches, if anything. They probably thought cars. I know that's what you're getting at. But anyway, <laughs> we're here to tell you to check the show notes. We're going to be talking about lots of things. We're going to be covering a lot of things that have happened over the past few months since Andrew was on, breaking his heart, telling us the, the breakup story of the century and how he started his own little fledgling company that's doing great guns. And uh, yeah, there's there's a whole lot of things we're going to be covering. So have a look in the show notes. That link will be in your podcast player. If you're watching this on YouTube, check the description and that will take you to our website to a specific page designated for this show in their tech spec links to watches and other things that we're going to be chatting about but i suppose we should do that thing where we catch up and i find out how life has been because we actually did catch up we've caught up a couple of times we caught up down south in england british watchmakers day and then over in geneva but how have things been since you left the big company it's hard to believe that it's only been three months since the video where I ousted myself as back on the market and single, if you like. Uh, but it's been a crazy three months. It feels like three years have gone by, but in a good way. Um, I've met so many people. I've done so many things. I've been given so many different opportunities. It is it is genuinely like a dream come true. I certainly hope it lasts many, many years into the future. I have no expectation that it will. And so really... <laughs> for every good thing that happens now, I'm thinking, oh man, I need to work hard to make sure I don't take that for granted and that I can continue to maintain this momentum and success. But absolutely very, very happy days. Um, I'm hoping for much more. Good. That was a very polished answer. So I'm going to delve deeper and <laughs> ask you, what things have you anticipated that were going to go one way, but have gone the other? Because we like to drill down a little bit. It's all very well getting the fairy story about how great things have been. But have you come across anything where you had a couple of ideas and maybe they didn't quite turn out the way you expected? Um, if I said no, does that make me seem arrogant? Because so far, it, everything has gone incredibly well. The, the real beauty of what's happened is that I get to do what I want, which is an unbelievable position to be in. I, I could have never imagined stepping out of school all those years ago thinking one day I will just get to do what I want and it's going to put food on the table and keep the lights on. So I, I see every opportunity I've had as either something that's come to fruition or a learning opportunity. So I have spoken to, uh, you know, have, has some opportunities spoken to some brands where it's not worked out, but it's not worked out for reasons that are positive for me. Either that actually what they're doing and the arrangement that they wanted isn't something that I would want. And so I've learned that I can say no to that. That makes me very happy knowing that I can do that and continue to maintain uh, success in what I do. Or it does become something, and then it it becomes another opportunity to um, to, to sort of further grow the business as it stands. This is all sounding very kind of political, talking around the topic. Maybe I should take the hands of time and wind them back slightly, because there's a misconception I know within the industry and within people that view your videos, listen to our podcast, etc., that Andrew Morgan Watches is just a YouTube channel. And we did touch upon this back three months ago when we explained that you were leaving and you were doing your own thing. 
but even I didn't have a full understanding of exactly what type of service it is you're offering. And it's not to the collectors, it's not to the dealer networks, it's to the brands. And I will do a quick synopsis of what you told me very recently. The kind of blurb on the back of Andrew Morgan Watches, the, the title, the first tome that's come out. And that is, when you were at Watchfinder, people, including myself, thought of you as the guy with the talking hands, the guy that didn't show his face until later on down the, his career path. But you would talk about a watch and we'd look at the watch and the watch looked great and that was it. But it turned out behind the scenes, you were highlighting specific models, perhaps brands that were doing okay or not so great. But due to the fact that you were recording in such great fidelity, producing such great content, writing amazing scripts and weaving it all together as a great tapestry, they were seeing benefits because their marketing messages, the information they were trying to convey to potential and existing customers wasn't landing the way they wanted it, wasn't transferring to people buying the watches and loving them, but you were managing to do that. And that is what you're now offering to the greater watch world. Well, there you go. Just listen to him. Follow his words. <laughs> they are good words. <laughs> I So this, this is something that a lot of people don't realize. When I worked at Watchfinder, I wasn't just doing the videos I was taking... Well, give us the, the bit of history then, your career trajectory, recap it for new people and existing people that are maybe failing in the grey matter, this guy here. How did it start at Watchfinder? What did you really do there? What did I really do? Well, to start, I have to start right at the start, which was before Watchfinder. And there'll be some people who have heard this story before, so I apologise. Um, I started my career as a civil engineer. I didn't have the money to go to university, so I got an apprenticeship as a CAD technician and worked with day release to get to become a civil engineer, which I really enjoyed. I enjoyed the, the creativity of that, the problem solving, um, but I didn't enjoy the bureaucracy. So remember that, that's, that's called foreshadowing. Um, so I, I really liked writing, I really liked uh, photography, and I really liked watches especially. So I decided to create my own job. And I had seen that Watchfinder was advertising for a, a copywriter to write descriptions for watches um, on their website. But that wasn't going to pay enough for me to quit my job as a civil engineer. So I decided to pitch them a different job. And I had seen in the automotive industry, which big fan of cars, they were creating things like blogs and, and vlogs and sites with forums engaging with the community to to build up a network of people who um, weren't just there to um weren't just there to buy and sell but they were also there to commune and in, enjoy and engage so i pitched that to watchfinder this idea of a community um from everything from blogs and blogs to, to forums and in-person events and they were like this sounds really cool and it just so happened that at the time, they were making a transition from being a 20-person shop in Maidstone in one building to becoming a fully-fledged brand. Now, what do I mean by brand? I mean something that actually has personality, that has more than just a transactional nature to it, something that gives more to the consumer. So you, you could say, for example, a Samsung phone is a product, but an Apple phone is a brand because there is stuff, intangible stuff around it that makes people have an emotional connection to it where they might not do over their Samsung product. And you'll have different people who want to work in different ways. So the community aspect, because Watchfinder didn't make any products that it could brand with its own personality, the community was all about the knowledge of the products. And so over time, uh, developed uh, developed a blog and then eventually this vlog, the the YouTube channel, to create all of that stuff. But it wasn't just that. So also working on the brand meant working on the bricks and mortar. It meant working on uh, the, the CRM, so email communications and things like that. The, the website engagement, how that was laid out and integrated and how people's experiences were. So the whole thing from start to finish was always something that I was involved with up to the point where basically I was the creative director at Watchfinder and then you know I decided to move on to other things. And as part of the YouTube channel and the videos, what I realized kind of posthumously, if you like, that I was doing was that when brands approached and they said, hey, do you want to feature this? Or I was looking around and seeing what was coming out. 
there were reasons that I would pick some things and reasons that I would not pick other things. And those reasons were really based on whether or not I thought they added value to people over a number of different aspects. Were they, did they look really good? Was the quality great? Did they provide excellent value for money? And how many of those things did they do? Some watches managed to hit all of them, some managed to hit a couple, and some hit none. If they hit none, I'd say, sorry, no, thank you. I can't do anything with this. And the ones that hit a few, I had conversations with those brands and helped them understand why, helped them better communicate their product uh, to, to, to better add value to the aspects they did have, and feed back to them on the parts that weren't as good to help them improve them for next time. And just by happenstance, so I decided I was going to leave Watchfinder and do my own channel. I'd already been working on my channel for about a year, and it was going very, very well. And when I started to talk to brands to say, oh, you know, just in passing, I was, oh, I'm leaving. They were saying, well, you've, you've helped us before. We'd really like you to help us more if you can. And the idea came, well, why don't I do that? And so... What has evolved from that is uh, a consultancy whereby I work with brands effectively to help them in communication. And communication can be they have a fantastic product, but they just don't know how to get it out there. They have uh, a, a great technical ability, but they just, just don't get brand and how to consolidate all of the things they do and uh, concisely explain them to people. Or it might be that they have an incredible heritage, but they just are a little bit lost in their way trying to find out how to make the product that is viable and suitable for an audience of today. And for me, that communication ranges all the way from uh, the things that you say about it. What platforms do you talk about it on? What kind of things do you say? But actually, all the way up to the very, very essence of where it all starts, the product itself. This is the dream that I'm starting to live is having a say in what these products actually are. It's terrifying. It's utterly terrifying. Yeah, I have never experienced so much imposter syndrome in all my life, but my approach is always to give justification for what I do. And I think if I continue to do that, it will, it will continue to go well. And so far, there have been some experiences, even in these tiny few three months worth of work that have have, have lifted my confidence, pieces of advice, uh, opportunities that have been uh, created for people that I've worked with in order to help them do better. And what this means for me, because it was very important for me to maintain this, um, to maintain this independence of my of my channel. And so people think that the Watchfinder channel was paid sponsorship all the time, never took a penny from anyone. And I really enjoyed being able to pick and choose the stuff that I wanted to talk about. And what you'll see over the years at Watchfinder is how I discovered brands. You know, I, I fell in love with Rolex and then I started to become cynical. And then actually I realized that they were more than I had ever anticipated. The discovery of independent brands, big and small, the new watchmakers who are taking different approaches to making watches. And I want to be able to continue to tell their stories and not be bogged down by the commercial aspect. Um, so this is a bit of a, a bizarre concept for some, but I, I don't charge watch brands to feature on my YouTube channel because I just want to pick whatever I want. If I pick a brand, for example, and I feature them and they say, wow, that was, you brought us all these sales and are oh, brilliant. And they want to make a contribution. Sure. Why not? But I'm never going to say to you, if you want to be on my channel, it'll cost you this, that, and the other. Because what I want to do is I want to feature brands that I think are either really, really good and maybe they'll let me work with them and it'll be a dream come true or brands that are like hitting some of those aspects and I can then come along and help them hit the others as well. And so it, hopefully, so far so good, it creates this self-fulfilling prophecy of creating value for everyone um, and most importantly myself because it, uh, it keeps me a happy boy. Well, there we go. That's a bit of an insight into the behind the scenes that only I picked up the full extent of within the last week when I was chatting, getting this episode organised. And it makes a lot of sense because the way I looked at what you just said and the way you told me a few days ago is 
If you bring a brand on, you'll bring them on because you like what they've done. You've got something you can talk about. Not what they're telling you in the future. None of this airy-fairy stuff that all the brands love to talk about. Here's our plan. Um, But if a brand hasn't quite gotten to that point where you're invested enough to bring their product on to showcase, then if they get in touch with you and you work on it with them in the future because you worked on it and you obviously like what you work on, the chances are then they can appear and you have investment in it because it's part of your family. You know, it's your little baby that you've worked on alongside. So I think that's a great concept. And I love the fact that you've taken your time. You haven't burst in. And I'm I'm fighting with myself not to say it. So I'll just say it. Recently, we talked about Ben Clymer at Hodinkee and the negative press that they received. And part of his ending, his third act of whichever interview it was that people had given him was, oh, just wait, things will get better. Wait till you see what we've got up our sleeve. And that always means that you really don't know what you're doing and you're guessing and you're hoping. If you had something tangible, you would talk about it. And the way that you're explaining the way the business has developed, which most people thought you were going to do exactly the same thing, watch Finder onto your own channel. It is not the case. But you've managed to also upgrade the quality of the content you're putting out, almost as if you didn't quite have your foot to the floor. So that, I think, was as much to do with a self-limitation because of being encapsulated within a brand. So what I've really let myself loose with now is enjoying the humor aspect. I I love humor. I may seem like a a miserable bastard, but I I do enjoy a, a little a little tickle of a laugh every now and then. And it wasn't appropriate for Watchfinder. So again, I was the guy in charge of what that brand was at Watchfinder. So I was the one determining that it shouldn't push beyond a certain limit. The idea was to encourage people to have trust in the Watchfinder brand. And so being ridiculous didn't really fall in line with that. But having my own channel meant that I could kind of let loose and have a bit of a laugh and in, and enjoy the industry for for what it is. You know, it's not just a serious thing. It's a, a collection of crazy events that all seem to be happening at once um, and, and poke some fun at that, as you do too. And I think you've really set the benchmark way back in the day for not taking all of this too seriously. And look at the longevity it's given you as well. Uh, and, and I wanted to steal some of that juju from you. I'll be honest. I wanted some of it for my very self. You've done well. And I have noticed the change and reading the comments in your videos. People have picked up on it. The shackles have been loosened. You've managed to escape <laughs> the tyranny of the conglomerate. And I know what it's like. There was a show that you probably heard on Thursday where there were three jokes that I probably usually would have cut out because they were a little bit too close to the bone. And I thought, why am I limiting myself? Nobody is paying me to do this show. It's not like I've got a contract with a brand and I've got to toe the company line. I just went hell for leather. I've kept an eye on the comments because it only got released as we're recording today. But so far, so good. No cease and desist. No one has decided to try and cancel me just yet. But it is a very fine line. And it's also not trying to inject humour where it doesn't exist. You know that try-hard comedian or the person at school that always wants to be noticed and they're just pushing a little bit too hard. I think, as I say all the time, watches are a hobby. You don't need them. They're great fun and it gives us something to enjoy and talk about and learn about. And if I can just make that a little bit more exciting for folks, all the better. A guy that will be on next week's show, and I've talked about it a little bit in the past, is Patrick Gray from the Risky Business Security Podcast. He talks about cybersecurity. What a boring subject that is. But he injects so much humour. <laughs> I remember he was talking about different ransomware gangs and how they infiltrated things. And he's like, you know what? Good on them. They managed to get in. So he talks about things that you probably shouldn't say cool things about, but he does it in such a humorous manner. He gets away with it. Plus, he's from down under. And a bit like Scottish people, we have that kind of dodgy humor gene. But we should move on to other things. And the thing we always forget to do, we talk about the show notes, but we don't tell people about the wrist check. And I believe you actually are wearing something today that you can show off. And it's a pretty little number. So reveal all, Andrew, what is on the hand today? Today, Ricky... I am wearing, I don't think this will be much of a surprise to anyone, to be honest, but I like it very much. I'm wearing my Christopher Ward Bel Canto in red. This is uh, a one of one that I was very lucky uh, to be able to get. And I have put it on a white rubber Delugs strap, um, in case you're wondering, because you're probably looking at it and thinking, he doesn't seem cool enough to wear a white strap. And I'm not, but who knows, it might 
I, <laughs> I might absorb some coolness from it. One, as I've expressed before, <laughs> much to Mike's dismay, the leather straps on the bel canto are terrible. They are, I described them before as like, you know, when you, you you pick a dried slug off your shoe, it's a little bit like that. It's kind of got that sort of rubbery resistance with a bit of crispiness to it. So I thought I'll put my own strap. I will interject because you're going to go on a di- tirade here that's well deserved, but I will interrupt a little bit. Is it the same leather strap that is on the moon phase? Because I found that to be the best leather strap that I have ever encountered. I don't know. I don't know if it is the same strap. Is it thinner than a piece of paper? Can you read the newspaper no. through it? No. Okay, maybe it's not the same no. strap. I'm going to get a message from Patrick at Christopher Ward saying, actually, it is the same strap, you idiot. Um, so we'll see. So maybe that one's terrible and you have low expectations for what your your leather should look like. Well, that's why you're a guest. <laughs> In any case, a lot of brands are very resistant to the idea of third-party straps, and I just don't get it. Because a third-party strap, one, it protects you if the manufacturer stops making straps for your watches. But two, it also allows you to change up the personality of your strap and makes you more likely to share it with other people, especially on social media, which actually gives more visibility to that watch. Um, The brands say, oh, no, but we didn't get to sell a £300 leather strap. It's like, first, that's a lot of money for a leather strap. But why not embrace it? Why not make those strap brands authorized and licensed the ability to sell under your brand name and make some money that way instead it's a little bit like third party camera lenses and this is and i say don't be very quick because i don't want to piss people off back in the day up until recently when maybe in the past 20 years cameras have had cpus inside the lenses and more so more recently the new mirrorless models especially canon they would not allow connection of the lens to the system inside the camera so your metering your depth uh, f-stops all that it wouldn't transfer across nikon seemed to allow it fine panasonic seemed to allow it fine sony allowed it but canon would not allow third-party lenses to utilize their technology and only very very recently have they opened up and we're not talking about public domain we're talking about licensing and it's quite similar i find to what you're talking about with watch brands or even car companies car companies will look for any excuse to kill your warranty including i found out if you've got a porsche with a warranty and you change the tires on it and they are not n rated they will void your warranty it's like it's tires you know it's ridiculous so i fully agree with what you say speaking of warranties actually i heard a very interesting fact about grand seiko so you know how the 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 yen is down at the moment and so people are going to japan to buy watches um people are going specifically to japan to buy grand seikos and do a little bit of a a pilgrimage for want of a better word and they come home with their their brand new Grand Seiko, fresh from Japan. It might even be a Japan special edition. Then they might need to go and take it for a warranty repair. And they find out that warranty is JDM only. And they couldn't read this because the whole manual was in Japanese. <laughs> so people are discovering that they are buying a watch, that the warranty can't be used outside of Japan when they buy it in Japan. That's something you wouldn't think about. A worldwide international warranty you just take it for granted yeah. that that is going to be the case and i know with rolex and various other manufacturers they don't do region specific stuff but that seems a little bit crazy especially the brand that's trying to grow as much as grand seiko are. but anyway we've talked about your little watch there so it's a one of one unique piece you got it from mike france he hand delivered it with patrick opening the door and all the rest of it when did you <laughs> get it and what is your thoughts on the whole christopher ward thing at the moment because we've talked at length about the public perception of 12x and the fact that people didn't like the fact that it was over four grand and we kind of showed people the reasons for it but you've obviously got a channel on youtube we're predominantly a podcast what was the perception like when you were talking about this so christopher ward is a fascinating company i think of it almost as much as a tech company as i do a watchmaker because a lot of what they pursue isn't to to say like this is the Christopher Ward look and feel what they present actually is here is an opportunity to reach into areas of watchmaking that you hadn't previously thought you could and so they try and find different ways to approach old fashioned problems with newer thinking so the bel canto is an example of that utilizing uh, an approach to supply chain in order to bring different talents together to make a watch that should cost much more at a cost that is much more relatively affordable. 
So um, talking to uh, Jörg Senior there, who uh, orchestrated a lot of the process, he was saying, for example, he would go to a supplier in Switzerland that makes wheels. And he would say, 10 wheels, please. And they would say, yeah, sure, that's however many Swiss francs. And he'd say, like, well, why is it that much? And they'd say, oh, we use this machine to make them. And he'd say, well, why don't you use that machine over there? That machine would make them cheaper. And the supplier would say, well, I've never thought about that. All the big brands that come to us just say, make them, and we've made them on this machine, and that's how much they cost. So they are looking for efficiencies in every single aspect of the supply chain in order to make the prices come down. And I find that fascinating. And the 12X was, I wouldn't say it was a misstep, but I think it's a, a missed opportunity in the communication. Because what they have done is they have they have looked into the machine finishing, a higher level of machine finishing. Of course, we all want our watches to be hand finished by a wizened old man up a mountain in Switzerland, but he's expensive. He's got sky bills to pay. And so what we actually look for is ways to replicate that at a lower cost that make it more affordable to all of us. I, I don't think anyone would deny the opportunity to have better finishing in their watch for a lower cost, even at the sacrifice of it being made by machine. Um, I don't think that interferes with the ability for brands that are doing things by hand to continue doing that and perhaps even charge more for it. Look at the Grubel Falsy Handmade One, for example. And so what they discovered with the 12X was that they could use machines and, again, that supply chain, uh, the, the technical process of narrowing every detail down. How can you actually engineer a bevel that is well polished by machine for an affordable price? And so when you compare the 12X to something like the Zenith Defy, which currently lists the, the, the skeleton at around £10,000, I think, what you'll realize is the Defy doesn't have polished bevels. It's you know, CNC'd, it's quite intricate, but it doesn't have those little details. The problem for Christopher Ward is those little details are very, very small and very hard to perceive unless you know what you're looking for. And you know, you, you and I know that someone will go to um, a watchmaker like Patek Philippe or Vacheron or even higher up like the Romain Gautiers or the Reget Regepis because they are after that every last little facet of, of perfection. They get this idea of the law of diminishing returns. But at 4K, that law of diminishing returns is we're not as familiar with that, that the, the microcosm of that law of diminishing returns higher up. So 4K seems like a lot for that watch. Um, and I think for Christopher Ward, what they really need to focus on is being able to find avenues like that that are impactful and very readable in a three second glance in an Instagram post. That's what they did with the Bel Canto. The 12X didn't quite achieve that. That's a great summary. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And you've managed to explain what took me nearly an hour with Mike to go through and uh, <laughs> convince people. And I'm going to say convince because when we put that out as a YouTube video, and our YouTube videos fall a couple of weeks generally after the main show, if we get round to them at all. We're getting better at it, but as you know better than anybody, producing video content takes a hell of a lot longer than audio. And when we're producing two podcasts of an hour roughly each per week in audio, to then do another hour or two hours of video is mammoth. So we've got Gavin working behind the scenes. He's doing a great job. It's just it takes a while. But we did get Mike's video out there in the YouTube comments. Again, I used a little bit of your terminology and your clickbait ideas. I put the title as 4K for a Christopher Ward watch. Stay in your lane. And all the people that initially thought, yeah, you know, fuck those guys. They jumped on to watch the video and were like, yeah, 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 yeah. And as they're watching it, they probably started to maybe get a little bit of a mind meld from me. I hypnotized them into thinking a different way. And the comments underneath went, yeah, actually, you're kind of making sense, you guys. I never thought of this. I never understood that. That ties it all together for us. So I managed to convince some people of things that they didn't believe initially, which I suppose is why we're here. We're here to open up new ideas and fight against what maybe people thought of the past and show them that you can get great results and it's not going to cost you 14 grand or 40 grand you can get it at four grand it's very impressive what they're doing and of course when you try and push the limits like that you're not always going to get it 100 percent spot on and i think even for them they are still reeling at the idea of the bel canto being such a success but the the 12 as well okay on one hand you could say it's incredibly derivative looks 
almost identical to certain other watches um, <laughs> made by other brands for more money. Wait till you get to my rust check. <laughs> Foreshadowing. Um, but the, the 12 offers an experience that is, as someone who has, who's had the, the great privilege to own a Royal Oak in the past, really, really hits upon those same notes. And they're sometimes they're just like psychological things that maybe even Christopher Ward didn't realize that they were doing. But having the 12 under a centimeter and the titanium version, even another millimeter thinner than that, having that slimness on your wrist feels very, very high end. And again, I think with the 12X, it was a bit bigger, it was a bit thicker, and it lost some of that by comparison. But things like the 12, they just absolutely hit. So sometimes they're going to have to just work on things and every now and then they're going to have a smash hit i think when it comes out and people get it on wrist because there was limited production samples we got one and that's how we managed to film some things i recorded a really cool video clip and i showed you and i was all happy i was like look at this mum. look what i produced and it was using a technique that i maybe spoke about in the show before that i employed in high school when i didn't like people and uh, a little bit of subterfuge went on and i would say to them here hold this and they would hold some steel wool and I'd say, right, see how long you can hold on to steel wool for. And then I would plunge a 9 volt PP3 battery into it. And what happens if you've not done this before is all the bits of steel wool suddenly catch fire and they spread like a virus, like the matrix and the green stuff coming down the screen. But it is blisteringly hot metal that is there. So nobody could hold on to it for too long. And I probably burned a few hands, uh, but the, the statute limitations and all that. And I was a child, so don't worry about it. That's not what we're here for. But what I did was I put the same idea, put strands of steel wool underneath the 12X. There was a see-through transparent plastic on top and underneath to protect the watch and give a little bit of variance to the size and the depth of it. Lit the thing up, recorded the video clip, took ages to set up. The clip lasted about a second long story of my life and i sent it to andrew and he watched it and he went did you put an ipad under that <laughs> not great but no christopher ward doing fantastic stuff we're, we're going to get mike on more because he's only been on once in the last year and a half or thereabouts and they've got people that like to talk about you they don't hide stuff they're very transparent with what they do the costs who they work with and where they invest their money and they are reinvesting it's not a case of oh we did great with Belcanto. we're off to the bahamas they bought a 20% stake in this place over in Beale that I visited once before. And there's lots of things happening behind the scenes. We are privy to a little bit more information on new models and releases coming down the line. But 12 was great. Belcanto was great, although I didn't like it myself. I didn't buy one. I didn't even ask for a loan of one because I looked at it and thought, that is not my style or aesthetic. Yeah, okay, it's cool. It's got the chime and whatnot. But everybody jumped on it. And again, I think that was potentially down to perhaps a video that you produced on it. I, I think, to be honest, what what sold that watch is what we were talking about earlier. It, okay, it doesn't, it, the, the looks don't appeal to everyone, but people who like that kind of watch are the people who looked at things like MBNF and thought, I can never afford one of those. And then this turns up. And the quality is there as well because they've selectively chosen to hand polish certain aspects. They've not gone throughout the whole thing because that would cost too much. But just the right bits that catch your eye, it's just very clever and selective. And then the price being down, it, it had no chance not to succeed, if I've got my double negatives right there. Um, it's It was always going to do well, without a doubt. They didn't believe it, but it did. Um, and I think it will continue to do well. And, and the thing as well, this this all sounds like a whole big Christopher Ward plug. And up until now, I haven't worked with him, but I do have a project coming up with him, which I'm very excited about. And I don't know how much I can say, so maybe I'll just say that, but we'll see. Um, but Mike, he's already loaded. He retired. He made his mint and then went on a sat on a beach and got bored and decided to start a watch company. This is a hobby for him. He is making this because he wants to because he's passionate about doing it and wants to create stuff that makes people happy to to be fulfilling you know the people who work there you meet them and you talk to them they're all hugely passionate about what they do because they are part of this enterprise of dreams so to speak it's not a he's he's not a guy that's been hired in by the business to you know sort the business out and make christopher ward better to try and rebrand it and change the logo to look like north face or whatever it was stone island stone <laughs> he is just doing it because he wants to do it 
And I think that has the ripples through. Like things like the they're very transparent about the margin being three times instead of five to ten times like it is in much of the rest of the industry. Because he's just like, that's what I'm doing. I'm doing it because I want to make it nice. Um, and I think that's really, really cool. You're right. He was on the show, one of the early episodes, and we got his history. And he told us that he'd been involved with the Early Learning Centre, which was a huge thing here in the UK. I don't know if it still is, probably not. And back 20 plus years ago, he sold that and he made tens of millions, but got super bored and then decided, as you say, to start a watch company, but to do it online. And even back then, he wasn't a younger gentleman. You know, he wasn't the the in crowd doing all that kind of online web two stuff, but he turned it into a success and it's been there for a couple of decades and they're doing even better today than they were five years or 10 years ago. So enough of the Christopher Ward chat. I should probably do my wrist check. Yeah, let's do it. I'm wearing something that is, again, going to foreshadow a podcast I'm going to record with somebody that's in Scotland. Stays less than maybe 100 miles away, probably an hour or two, well, depending on how quickly I ride my motorcycle, an hour or two away from me. And we've never had him on the show, which is kind of odd. And his name is The Dial Artist. And as soon as I said that, you'll know what I'm talking about. He takes ink spatter design and other sort of cues from the fashion industry world, the art world, and he takes that and miniaturizes it down to the size of a dial. So if you can imagine a canvas, a billboard, down to just a couple of centimetres, and Andrew knows what a couple of centimetres is. So I am today wearing a limited edition that he has produced in association and collaboration with Noon, and that is spelt N-U-U-N, a brand we've spoken about in the show before, because they make watches that highlight the design cues and the ethos of the Genta family. Let's just leave it at that. But this one here, if you can get past the similarities that we've spoken about just a few minutes ago about stainless steel sports watches, this is pretty funky. I believe it comes in around about 400, 500 pounds. This is obviously not solid gold. This is IP coated, but at that price point, at that thinness for a little watch that has got a lot of character on the dial. And I don't know if this is a style that Andrew would like or Andrew would talk about, but I actually do quite like it. And at this price point, I think it's a bit of a win. I'm not going to go too deep into it. You can look in the show notes to find out more. And you can obviously listen to the episode where we talk to him about how he designs stuff, his love of horology, watchmaking, and working with multiple brands. We're not just talking about these guys over in the Far East. He's done stuff with IFL and loads of other companies, brands, watchmakers of the past. Might even be a collab in our future. Who knows what's going on there? But this is a fantastic little watch. Yes, it does look like a knotless. We ain't going to lie about it. But, you know, lots of watches look like lots of watches. And we just talked about the 12 and the 12X. The only negative, and I like to highlight the positives and the negatives of things, this would not be a watch that you would ever want to wear in London. But that is it. Enough said. This is a limited edition from Noon and the Dial Artist, and it's available just now on their website. Details will be in the show notes. And this is not a sponsored episode, so that was a free plug as well. Imagine getting smashed over the head for 500 quid. That would really suck. We are recording another show, yet again, preamble and a little bit of foreshadowing with two gentlemen from the police. They've been on the show before. They work for the Flying Squad and the Metropolitan Police down south. And there's been a lot of negativity due to published articles about bad things that have happened, especially here in the UK, especially in London, to do with watch crime. It is on the rise as we come into summer. Bad things have happened, really bad things have happened with a watch dealer that it appears took his own life after being robbed in his store or a store that he worked in. So we're going to have the two guys from the police back on just to give us an update and a bit of a refresher that, yeah, we're enjoying stuff, the sun's staying out longer, but we want to have our watches remaining on the wrist, not disappearing, and potentially life-threatening consequences that happen thereafter. So enough of that. We'll talk about that in the future. Back to Andrew. And we want to find out what's in your future. We found out about the past three months. It's been action-packed. You were across at Watches and Wonders, but we're playing with an Invicta watch that appeared in an Instagram reel that I have been sent screen captures of almost hourly for the past couple of days. So thanks very much for that one. Um, what else has been happening? What's been on the go? What things have you seen that you like? Maybe you could give us like your top five, top five videos that you've made, something like that. Sure. Do you want me to talk about the Invicta thing as well? Yeah, let's go into the Invicta story. How did this all come to be? We've had the Tim version and he was on the show <laughs> telling us, obviously, he's working with you on things behind the scenes. He's also working with us on things behind the scenes because... Because 
you're a guy that even way, way back, the first time I met you was two years, two and a bit years ago at Watch and Wonders, and you wandered over. I didn't recognise your face because nobody knew what you looked like. You were like Charlie from Charlie's Angels. And you came over with a chat. And since then, we've worked on a whole load of projects back with Watchfinder across in Geneva. And now we're doing things. There might even be a sort of regular show coming soon. Stay tuned for that one. Oh, that'd be nice. That would be nice. You know, we're talking about things. Yeah, we'll leave that sitting. Just um, a lot of foreshadowing. Not foreskinning, but foreshadowing in this episode. <laughs> so moving on to what's been happening. Fill us in. Bring us up to speed. So the, the Invicta has been... Um... A big highlight of my year so far, as I think it has been for many people, because nothing brings about joy more than the misery of others, or in fact, <laughs> or in fact, indeed, the, the the misery of an object itself. This is the most disgusting watch in the entire world, the Invicta Gladiator, I believe, from the Reserve series, a reserved only for people who have drunk too much paint. Um, speaking of which. That's a fancy looking beverage you got there. Is that the is that an energy drink that gets you no. through the night editing? It doesn't say limited edition. I hoped it would, but it doesn't. It's iron brew. Power brew. Of course it's iron brew. <laughs> For Scottish people. <laughs> oh you <laughs> cliche. Um so well basically that watch had featured in a video a while back of just horrible worst watches ever, and a friend of mine. Rob Huberty, former Navy SEAL, all-round nice guy, decided out of the blue that he was going to buy one and bring it to Watches and Wonders. I'm surprised he wasn't arrested at the border for bringing that monstrosity into Switzerland, but he got it in there and um, it was just like a stupid joke, really, where he showed it to me, I tried it on. We <laughs> I, I was wearing it throughout the tour in the, the Rolex stands because they had that whole, you know, the, the life cycle of the GMT. And the lady was telling us when I was asking questions, this, you know, this stupid watch hanging off my wrist. Um, and it was very, very hard to keep a straight face. But the lady who was doing the presentation, to be fair, absolutely 100% kept it all together. Very, very, very professional. And, and we thought, we're having a great time with this thing. We should see who else might enjoy it. And so through the course of the week of Watches and Wonders, it, we would meet people and we would go like, oh, what, what do you think of this? And it, it started to get a bit out of hand because it was just, you know, our friends and other people that we knew and people that we were meeting. Dave. And then, <laughs> and then, uh, and then it was a few CEOs. What do you think? And, and everyone just seemed to really love it. You know, we were all just reveling in its hideousness. And um, it got to the point where we were at the AHCI uh, event. It's like a, where, where they show these cool independent brands, the pirates, as they're known. Um, and they are out in Geneva. And, and you go in there. And Philippe Dufour was there. And he was just looking at some stuff and talking to some people. And he was just sort of getting ready to leave. And we were like, rub, 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 rub. Go and ask Philippe Dufour. And he's like, I can't do that. That's ridiculous. You can't ask Philippe Dufour to have a look at this thing. So like, do it. You only get one chance and you'll regret it if you don't. So, I mean, there's, there's not a braver person that you can ask than a Navy SEAL. And even he had gone bright red at the thought of this. And he did it. And we thought, oh, you know, I've, I've never met Philippe before. I don't think he speaks very much English. And I thought maybe he would find the whole thing confusing. And... <laughs> quite rightly disgusting but he didn't this guy was in stitches he was he was laughing away to himself he was looking at this watch and we were all enjoying it and then he went a step further he said ah hang on a second and he reached into his pocket and he pulled out the first simplicity he had ever made like this this watch if it went at auction would do gangbusters it would be well into the millions he pulled it out of his pocket Held one in one hand and the other in the other. It was like, oh, yeah. Which which do you guys think is better? Like, completely straight. It was just the funniest thing ever. And it, it was just the it was just the pinnacle to this ridiculous journey that this watch had gone on, bringing all these different people together. And because Watches and Wonders, for people who haven't been there before, is a very cool event. And you get to see all of your favorite watches. And Bremont's. <laughs> <laughs> but the vibe at the actual show can sometimes feel a bit, I don't want to say oppressive, but most of the people there might be retailers, uh, especially on the, the closed days, the, the private days. And you don't get the sense of like 
passion and a vibe and and stuff like that. Um, and this showing this to people actually brought that vibe back. It was it was at dinners, it was at different shows around Geneva, it was whoever we met. This this thing came. Out. It was a heavy thing for Rob to carry around as well. It's an absolute lump, um, and it just it just absolutely made the event. So there's a little reel going around on Instagram of that journey. Uh, check it out. There's some good cameos from some people that you wouldn't expect in there, including yourself. Everybody who's anybody is in there. So yeah, one to check out. That'll be in the show notes and we'll include that in the YouTube video. But apart from that, what else has been happening and what's in the future for AMW? What videos have you got coming out? You've changed things up, as I said. Watchfinder videos, they were not cookie cutter because everything you did was unique and had its own theme. But things have just been, I don't know, you've spinal tapped it up to 11 a little bit on the amplification module. What is next? What have you got, what have you got coming down the line? What are you going to impress us with next? So I am looking to do more videos of product reviews. One of the great challenges of doing watch reviews and watch videos is having access to the product. And so I've looked to find a format that I don't necessarily need that, that I can talk about things that I've seen and experienced, but I don't necessarily have to have all of that at home in the studio and shoot it all, so on and so forth. But I do want to make sure I continue with live hands-on reviews of certain products that I think are very interesting. And so I'm establishing more of that. I've done a couple now and I'm going to be doing some more, but there's a very special element that will be coming because this is a bit of behind the scenes. Ricky and I, we were talking and you showed me a shot that I had featured in a video, which was from the brand. And you'd asked me if it was mine and it wasn't mine. And I've been trying to figure out how to make that shot happen. So with the reviews, I'm going to be pushing for uh, more interesting, more dynamic more shots that reveal a product in its three dimensions that don't feel flat, that have movement to them and interest. So people can enjoy the watches on a greater level when they do watch one of my reviews. So I'm always looking for new little devices that pop up on Amazon and things that I can break apart and reconfigure to do what I want to do with them. So keep an eye out for that, Ricky. I might meet your challenge soon. Okay. Well, I am a junkie. Not just for watches and other things, but camera equipment. We talk about it in the show all the time. People actually do like it. They don't skip forward. They do check the sort of analytics. And I, uh, I, I seem to be a bit of a whore for buying tripods and light stands and things. And there's a guy called Marcus Picks on YouTube. And it's all his fault. He seems to be some retired multi, multi-millionaire. And he just buys camera equipment and talks about it and showcases it. And I do the same. What things have you picked up then or what things have you got your eye on, new technologies or new products that you're going to be looking at integrating towards the channel? What's going to help you out in the future? Well, first of all, I have an irrational hatred of light stands because no matter how much space you have in your studio, there's one light stand and you always can't quite get it past another light stand and they conflict with each other and it, that, that brings involuntary rage. I try and keep my light stand count down if I can. Um, but what am I looking for? Okay, right, I'm, I'm a, a, a tech junkie too. I'm always looking at the latest things, like what's come out at, um, uh, is it NAB? Is NAB the one? NAB. Yeah. Uh, what's coming out there? And Blackmagic, who are um, a camera company, video camera company that I very much enjoy, who, <laughs> a bit like the Christopher Ward of the camera company, they give you great technology for not very much money. They have, they had a while ago released a 12K sensor which sounds utterly ridiculous in terms of the pursuit of extra resolution. You know, most TVs, you can't really discern the difference between 1080p and 4K. Like, it's just, you're not perceiving enough resolution. So why would I want 12K? Well, the great thing is, is it allows you to crop into shots and do things dynamically with them with all of that extra resolution. But also as well, so this is going to sound really petty, but I'm sure other photographers and videographers will, will relate. So when you buy camera gear, you want it to look professional. You don't want it to look amateurish. You don't want the you want it all to look like what you've seen press and and in Hollywood. You want it to look like you know what you're doing. And the camera that I you have, don't want it to look like a Komodo dragon, where it literally <laughs> looks like a box like this. Oh, in white. I like the box because you can build on the box. It has like little screw threads in it. You can buy little accessories and arms and things that you can bolt. It. What you want is that setup where you can't even see the box anymore. And you have your lens and you have a matte box and you have rails and you have a, a follow focus and you have all of these extra things that you're not even using. You know, like a, a V-mount lock, battery lock plate. I've got it plugged into the mains. <laughs> 
But the camera that I have at the moment, which is the 6K Pocket, looks a bit like a toy DSLR. It's kind of plasticky and chunky, and it looks, it looks really... like a Sega Game Gear. It does. It really does. Ah, <laughs> oh, that's that was very satisfying. You've connected those. It does. It looks like a, it's just. It looks melted, doesn't it? And but now they've released a new version of that, which is the square box, which would make me feel much more professional by myself in my studio where no one can see me. So right now I'm having to rationalize not buying one because my irrational brain goes, yeah, yeah, you need that. But my rational brain says, you know, you don't. Your your camera is, does the job that you need it to do and this wouldn't improve it in any way at all. Okay, well, you've answered one question. Anything else in there? Because I've got a few things I'm going to tell people about that might feature on the channel soon. Shun? <laughs> You're doing your best Sean Connery impression. Oh, yes. What's coming up? Well, I never really know too much because I'm usually chasing my own tail. But I'm doing some stuff with some brands that I think people will really enjoy. So I'm producing a few videos here and there that will go out on their channels for them about their stuff. And they have rather foolishly said to me, do whatever you like. And so I am. Sometimes I think, you know, like I've got to play fair game here and I'm doing something that, you know, is is, is roughly what I think they also want, but injecting some stuff in there. But yeah, I've sent some scripts over for approval to them that have come back with no red lines. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> So yeah, I'm having a ball. Good, and that's the way it should be. Uh, there are lots of creators out there to a little bit of inside baseball information for folks. Teddy Baldessar produces content for lots of different watch companies. They don't tell you that he produces it. Christian Theo and Harris has been doing this for a number of years. We don't, because I don't have enough time to record two podcasts and edit two <laughs> videos a week. So I do not do this. But if any brands are interested, I mean, I did some stuff a couple of years ago for Arage. I helped do some second camera work. But it's finding the time and having the ideas. And you'll know what it's like because you're a creative and you're producing stuff. But it's having the proper ideas and the freedom to actually explore. Because you hit the nail on the head with Mike France earlier and a little bit like ourselves. We'd never came into this industry, this hobby, and now the career path we've taken by going to business school and mm -hmm. saying, okay, I want to be this type of person without knowing the industry we're going to fall in. Looking at LinkedIn all the time, there are so many people that went from something that is completely different to where they are now. And I'm talking about watch companies, PR people. Some of them are fantastic. We love them to pieces. Others are just there because it's a stepping stone to working with a jewellery company or a fashion company, the thing they're wanting to get to. So the fact that you are not that person, you're not the videographer that doesn't care about watches, you understand them. Finding somebody that can film properly, that spots the nuances of having the hands at the correct position, making sure there's not a smudge in the dial, that if there is a little scuff or a scratch, then it's touched up before the filming. That really does help. And all these brands that are working with you and talking to you, they're in good hands. They're in good talking hands. Oh, very good. Yeah. And I, I don't ever want to just produce videos that feel like everyone else's videos. If, if I work with the brand, it's in order to express a perspective, a narrative, an idea, a creativity into what they do, almost more as a, a collaborative piece rather than a, a faceless behind the scenes project. Um and it seems to be emerging more and more that creators who have a passion for watches, but also uh, a personality that they've got to to put out there, are, are doing really well. So, like, so take for example, Labeg. He's the guy who cuts out those cardboard shapes of watches, puts them together, and you have this sort of three D crap version of a watch, but is somehow really nice and just really charming and lovely. Um, and I, I have one of those, and he is doing phenomenally well because he has a voice and an identity and a personality. And I think now more than ever, that's what brands need so they can stand out from just being yet another, oh, we have been making watches for a hundred years in the Swiss, blah, blah, blah. You know, it, it, all, it all starts to get a little bit too much noise, doesn't it? So that, that's, what I'm, that's what I'm attempting to do. That's why I love the stuff that Moser continuously put out with their videos, because... If you look at the watches, you would think, yeah, okay, that's that's Vacheron, that's GLC level of history, heritage. And then you've got Ed sitting there in a video where the watch is talking to him, telling him to get the marketing guy to... So, yeah, <laughs> it works. It works phenomenally well. 
And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to all your future stuff. We've come to the end of our time here, but as we talked about earlier, I think we're going to do a more regular thing. It might be something like this. It might be slightly different. But if any brands are looking to get in touch with you about what you can offer them behind the scenes or in front of camera, definitely do so. All the contact details will be in the show notes. And likewise, if anyone wants to jump on here, any brands are interested in collabing with us, get in touch too, because we do loads of things with loads of companies, some of it you've seen before, some of it we're working on behind the scenes, and as much as you are putting off buying that new 12K video camera, I have been spending some pennies that I shouldn't have because I'm still in the house hunting phase of trying to get a new place, but I have got some new tripods, some new cameras, some new bits and bobs, some new lenses. Yeah, I actually avoided going to a camera event this week because I thought there might be something there that again would eat into a house deposit. So <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to be on the good side of Simona these days. But that is it. Do you want to tell people where they can find you as if they don't already know? If you want to find me, I'm on social media. I'm on uh, the website, the webs. Uh, andrewmorganwatches.com always good to be on the interwebs obviously you have got an Instagram that is growing you've got a YouTube channel that doesn't need to grow any further but it is doing great guns and obviously if you want to check out what we're up to probably the quickest place to see the new stuff is on Instagram so that is at Scottish Watches there our website scottishwatches.co.uk and we are on YouTube when we find the time to edit and upload Gav's doing a great job it's all my fault I never get the stuff to him in time same with Miz you know it's always falling on me I put my hands up especially when people email and they don't get a reply this guy anyway that is it so thank you for joining us and yeah we'll catch you again soon thank you for having me